All right, so this is part two of lecture one. Um, the first lecture was about 28 minutes, so this should take no longer than another 15 or 20 minutes. Um, so we're going to talk about teaming arrangements for the final design project. Uh, there will be roughly 25 teams of three students. I think I have one team right now that has four students, and I think somebody uh, dropped the class, and so I moved a student around. You should be able to see your teams on Canvas, and so uh, what I would like for you to do is go to Canvas. Okay, and in Canvas, <clears throat> Hold on just a second. Let me find my my uh, screen here. So in Canvas, sorry about that. Uh, you'll go here. Uh, what I see is when I go to People, uh, I see the final project teams, and I see these um, groups. <clears throat> so we have. Um, these groups here how it looks like we have a new student that entered okay so that student will go on uh, project 24 so these two teams will have four students so what I need you to do is go in here uh, and update your team name okay you'll see students in each one of these and then um, you know find the students in your group on canvas uh, reach out to them uh, your first homework assignment has already been posted today. It's due tomorrow. Uh, and you need to reach out to your group. You need to have your first group meeting. Uh, you can meet online. You can do FaceTime. You can do WhatsApp. You can do whatever you do. Um, but make sure you meet. And um, I suggest that you take your personality tests at 16personalities.com. It takes about 12 minutes. Uh, share your results with the team, uh, and then discuss what you think you bring to the team. Each person should do that, and then discuss what you'd like to get out of the class, and then pick somebody who will upload the assignments to the team. Um, so I think if you have that discussion, it'll make the rest of the semester a little bit easier, and you need to do that and upload it. You have to upload a file with your personality uh, letters and your sentences of what you would like to get out of the team and that's an individual assignment so all members of the team need to do that so I'll know if there's a member of the team that can't follow these simple instructions this is your first homework and will be counted towards part of your homework grade uh, during the class we'll use a simplified version of scrum um, which we'll talk about in the next lecture to try to make it a little bit easier for your team to stay on task and make your work visible. I've created a template for you as well, um, which should make it easier and less frustrating. And there's very, uh, there's only really the design um, uh, templates that you'll have. Um, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll give them to you. All right, so uh, let's talk about the syllabus. So most of the things we'll, we've covered in the syllabus, but I will show you um, some of the other things here. Still trying to open. Okay. All right, so this is our syllabus for this semester. Okay, uh, this is the textbook. It's the sixth edition of Norton. These are the, so these three textbooks, at one point this dominated the market and uh, took market share from this book. And then, um, this was this dominated for a little while. So these books have kind of shared first place off all one, two, three of these books. Uh, there's also another book called The Fundamentals of Machine Elements. This is a more recent publication. It has a more extensive treatment of lubrication and um, wear than the other books. Um, we're using this book because it's an integrated approach and it really incorporates the design uh, process that engineers go through in real practice. Um, so this is the book that we're going to use. I highly recommend you get these books if you don't have them already um, as references and um, being able to cross references. So our typical lecture is going to be about 150 minutes a week, which is what 350 minute class or 275 minute classes would be. Obviously, if we have a break, uh, it would be different that week. 
Um, these is, this is my contact information. Um, this is my email. Um, this is uh, Chunji's uh, email and his office hours. And so uh, I encourage you to meet with us. I have made myself available uh, almost every afternoon. Um, so you can click on this link and schedule a visit. <clears throat> um, and these are the topics that we're going to go through. Um, and so we'll cover, you know, normal shear principle stresses and strains in more circle. This should be a review for those of you who have taken your statics and mechanics of materials class. Uh, we'll talk about some stress distributions in cross sections under loading, bending of beams, buckling, singularity functions, uh, which is not always covered. Uh, we will definitely talk about and use, and we'll use software to support that so we can look at deflections of members. Uh, and then we talk about failure. We talk about failure, uh, static failure, uh, through uh, different failure criteria, the state of stress, how do we resolve that stress to find the uh, principal stresses, and then how do we use the failure criteria to see if something's going to fail for both brittle and ductile materials. We talk about failure in the terms of fatigue. So fatigue is uh, responsible for, I think, like 90, above 90% 90 of all failure is fatigue failure. Uh, it's a bit costs billions of dollars per year worldwide, and it's a sneaky failure mechanism, and we have to be able to design against it. And so we will do fatigue analysis. We'll look at um, the life cycle of parts. We'll understand that there's an endurance limit in some materials, such as steel, but there's not an endurance limit in other materials, such as aluminum. So that means if they exhibit cyclical stress over time, that all aluminum parts will fail. Uh, but we can project how long they will be loaded and get an estimate of how safe the design is. Uh, we'll talk about shafts. We'll talk about surface failure and wear, uh, stresses. Okay, so when we have uh, ball bearings running inside of a race, how do we actually ca uh, calculate the stress that the steel ball will experience in that raceway when it's a, a sphere and it has a theoretical point of contact? Uh, how do we actually... Um, calculate the stresses that we believe certain contact elements are going to experience. And then we'll talk about spur gears, um, which is uh, one of the most commonly used gears in machine elements. Um, we don't go into uh, helical gears, although the extension from the gears chapter will be very easy for you to um, go through helical gears, which are typically used for higher speed um, applications, and they're less noisy. Then we'll talk about uh, springs, bearings and lubrication, power screws, fasteners, riveting, welding, bonding, and brakes and clutches, uh, time permitting. <clears throat> so the prerequisites are solids um, and statics, obviously, is a prerequisite for solids. Um, what we hope I hope you get out of this is I, I hope you can use the basic equations for stress in machine components subject to different loading conditions and be able to see how safe designs are. Um, you have to be able to understand the failure theories and pick which failure theory applies to your design and design against failure uh, and design for safety. Okay, <clears throat> and obviously you have to be able to select the right components to solve the problems that you want to solve with your machine using shaft gears, bearing springs, and fasteners to solve the problems and welds. So the grades. <clears throat> so there's going to be four tests that are 15% each or 60% of the total. Uh, homework is 15%. Final project is 20%. And design reviews and progress reports are 5%. Okay. So this is the grade summary here, and if you get a 90 or above, you get uh, an A in the class. If you get less than a 60, you don't get an A, okay? It's your uh, normal grade uh, bins. Um, <clears throat> so at Canvas, I'll put, I'll put the grades in Canvas, um, and I will take the Canvas export, and I'll take a look at them, and I have the opportunity to add two points uh, or discretionary points based upon where we are in the semester. Um, and I will take into account the effort and the quality of your work. Um, the homework is pretty much going to be due. It says beginning of the due at the class, but I need to edit that. It's actually um, 
your homework is going to be due on the due date, usually at midnight, since we're all online. Uh, make sure that you use units and your work is neat. Uh, if your work is sloppy, I don't feel obligated to uh, grade it. Um, so make sure that your work is legible and uh, Right. The tests, which are 60%, will be take-home tests, and they'll take roughly, um, you know, uh, and you'll have more than enough time to complete them. Uh, the design reviews, you'll be graded by your peers, and I will reserve the right to overwrite the grade uh, from your peers for the design reviews. Uh, I will assign each person to review other teams' projects, and so everyone will be reviewing everybody else's design every review um, and I think I've limited you only have to look at four uh, other uh, teams um, designs then um, the final project itself will be the culmination of your design throughout the semester and it's 20% of your grade um, <clears throat> and so uh, that'll be due at the very end of the semester so we don't have live lectures uh, this semester. I need to edit this. I'm sorry that that's there. Um, but we will have times where we can uh, I can open up a, a, a online meeting and we can have a discussion maybe before a test or to review a concept. Uh, we'll kind of schedule those as we need uh, throughout the semester. Um, office hours, again, click on the link it'll automatically put it on my calendar and I'm trying to keep my calendar blocked off in the afternoons so that I'm available to you guys so academic integrity um, do your own work don't copy other people's work don't provide unauthorized uh, assistance um, if you're copying you'll get a zero and I'll turn you in so don't do that if you have a disability, then I encourage you to um, reach out to the Office of Disability Services um, so that they can help me understand what you need and I can help you uh, do well in the class with uh, your uh, with whatever you need <clears throat> in the class. Okay. So uh, one last thing that we need to talk about is uh, just a high level view of assessing our designs. So throughout this class, we will get to a place where we are calculating loads uh, usually, uh, and we compare the loads that we predict against the strength of the material, um, usually the yield strength or the fracture strength or whatever it is that makes sense for that problem. And we will evaluate uh, the design by comparing uh, the performance of the design and the load conditions, typically load conditions, to its factor of safety. Okay, so the factor of safety is just a unitless ratio, and it's usually the ratio of strength over stress. Okay, so that would be the strength of a material over the stress that the material experiences. And obviously, when you design a machine, the stress at different points um, is going to vary wildly. Um, and so you would have to identify the locations in the machine where the stress is the greatest, and then you'd compare that to the strength of material. Um, we could also look at the uh, critical load over the applied load and make sure that the, um, you know, the applied load is way less than the critical load or some limit load where we know bad things will happen. Uh, we can also look at the safety factor as a load to cause failure over the expected service load or the number of cycles, um, the maximum number of cycles that we think a design will handle uh, over the number of cycles that the component is going to experience. Uh, or if we're, t and then that's really like talking about fatigue life there. And then uh, we can also define the safety factor as um, the uh, ratio of the what we consider to be the safe speed over the operating speed because there's some speeds like the critical speed and shafts that we have to avoid and so we can see how far we are away from that so we think of safety factor we're really looking at the critical components of the design and how those components will fail and then we look at um, what those what we believe that design will experience during its life and often we will do a design and we'll find out we do not have a sufficient safety factor 
Okay, so the safety factor may come out to be like 0.75, which means you know we the the part will fail, the design will fail. So your safety factor always should be greater than one. Okay. Um, in reality, it's very difficult to predict uh, the loads that a component is actually going to experience for some more complicated machines. Um, you know, and there's been many stories of people that have lost their lives um, because people did not predict uh, what <clears throat> a device would experience. And things like high winds and snow and sleet and ice have caused things to fail. Um, there's a story in one of the books where some people were installing some service equipment and um, during the install not ever, not all of the adjacent equipment was installed which allowed uh, the equipment that they were installing to swing back and forth which would have never happened in the final design because it was constrained by adjacent ductwork. But when they were installing it, they installed it first. Uh, the um, uh, the units that they were installing, they would swing back and forth while they were installing them, and it caused uh, a, a failure in one of the support shafts, and one of the people installing it died uh, because of the order that it was installed in. Um, and so while we can do paper design, we really, as an engineer, have a responsibility to think about how people are actually going to be using uh, what we design and even the order of installation can uh, can matter so because of, there's a lot of things that are hard to predict like the future um, testing is often required even if we get some good paper design and whatnot we need to have a sense of you know how could this fail how could this hurt somebody what could go wrong what if somebody did this and um, as you know people are capable of doing some crazy things and so as an engineer and as a designer, it really is your responsibility uh, to consider um, all the ways that uh, what you design could be abused and, and try to make sure that nobody can get hurt uh, by overlooking something that you should have considered. Fortunately, we have codes that are enforced for many components that we have, like SAE, um, ASME, A ANSI. Uh, AGMA for gears. I mean, we have a lot of um, people that have spent a lot of time doing these tests so that we can confidently pick out components um, in our in our um, designs and have confidence that they they will work. Uh, but it's still uh, our responsibility. Okay. <clears throat> So this is just some guidelines. This is a starting point for the safety factor. So if you have a ductile material, then you'll take the maximum of one of these safety factors that you'd like to design against. Okay. So if you have material property information data from tests and the actual material used was tested, then a recommended safety factor of 1.3 is is going to be okay because you have a higher degree of confidence uh, in there. And obviously we know that um, all tests data has a statistical process. So if you have a, um, <clears throat> a value that you've secured from some property table, it has a statistical uncertainty associated with it. So you cannot necessarily take that value to the bank and design against that value. You have to have a little bit of room. Okay. And these are the different um, considerations, okay? So if you know the environments where it's going to be used and they're identical to the test conditions and this is the recommended safety factor, if you have a moderately challenging environment, and what is a moderately challenging environment? Well, it's really going to come up to your judgment. Um, if you have a corrosive uh, material that corrodes in a high moisture environment, then you're going to put this thing you know, closer to five. If you're like within a mile of the ocean and you have unexposed steel, then, you know, you, you need to be aware of that. <clears throat> um, if you're using analytical models from, you know, a simulation and you actually are able to test those models to validate their accuracy, then you can have a lower safety factor. If your models 
are crude and untested, then you have to have a much larger safety factor. So this is just a guideline, okay? This is not an exact science. So for specific applications, you can go to the, some of the standards. Um, and But if you don't and you're doing some of this, you're going to have to make these judgment calls, okay? And so this is some guidelines. If the material is ductile, then you pick the max of these F1, F2, or F3 um, safety factors and use it as your safety factor. Uh, if the material is brittle, which means it'll go all the way up into a certain load and then fracture, then you need to have a higher safety factor, okay? And in that case, you would use the maximum of the same table, but you'd double it, okay? And the reason that we would do that for ductile material, uh, brittle materials versus ductile materials is because the ductile material under load uh, has room to have a permanent set or in your stress train diagram, you have that plastically deforming region before failure. In more brittle materials, that region is uh, very, very small or non-existent. And so you will just load it to fracture. But in ductile materials, because there's some room for that material to uh, elongate and permanently deform, um, it's possible that you can survive that small deformation because it will relieve the stress, um, could relieve the stress while it uh, uh, changes shape permanently. Um, so you have a little bit more give when you're designing with uh, ductile materials. Okay, If you have brittle materials, when things break, they break catastrophically and you're going to have a problem. Um, and so that's why we use different safety factors for those two different materials. And we'll, we'll, we'll revisit this later in the semester. And again, as I said, many measured quantities have uncertainty, okay? So the statistics related to your measured quantity can matter, okay? So if you have a certain alloy and you go and pick the, the value for that alloy, it would be nice if you have a critical application, if you can know that the strength of that material is going to be within 5 or 10% of that value. Okay, when you don't really know, then you really should not design anywhere close to that value and shouldn't be shocked if it fails when you don't reach that perfect load. So you have to leave yourself some room and you cannot avoid testing in some cases for where you really need to take your design and stretch your design to the limits. All right, um, so another thing I want to draw your attention to is the um, resources that are available to you. So one of the other reasons that I like the Norton book is because he has taken the time to record videos um, on <clears throat> pretty much every chapter in the book. And he has examples and he has some clever machines. So I've uploaded this resource to Canvas for you. It is uh, located in the files here under resources. And if you click here, this is the Norton machine design and we have uh, all these links. So these are the, these are videos here that you can watch there, uh, go over everything in the book that we'll cover. Um, and also there's some other video examples, for example, um, there's a bearing video that shows various types of bearings uh, and gears and springs. Uh, and then there's videos for actual machines. <clears throat> and so some of these machines um, are pretty cool. These videos, um, you know, are, are dated, uh, but they, they are um, <clears throat> pretty cool. So you can click on the link, you'll get the video. Uh, in the video, uh, he talks about the different uh, components of a certain machine design. And you can use this for, um, you know, some benchmarking and sort of, you know, understanding what's going on. So I highly recommend that you explore those. We don't have time to go over them. They're not required, but they are a resource uh, that's available to you. <clears throat> the other resource you have available uh, to you are my videos uh, from the last two semesters. Okay, and if you go here, it'll take you to 
my channel and you can look at the videos that we recorded on various topics. Um, and um, the earlier videos are from a different book, but they're still uh, perhaps informative. And you can go to the playlist here. I've tried to put the machine design playlist uh, here. And so you can look at <clears throat> the, uh, the different videos that are on this uh, machine design playlist. So you have an awful lot of information available to you uh, that you can use. Uh, I highly recommend that you take a look around and um, uh, explore some of those videos. Okay. So if there's any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Also, um, do your homework, install EES, and start watching those first few videos on how to start using EES. Uh, I look forward to having a great semester uh, with you guys, and I will uh, talk to you soon.